Hi, it's Evan here, and, and on the uh, Evan eSense channel, this time we're going to be talking about uh, motor speed control on lathes. And once you've had this uh, capability of being able to vary the speed of the motor, uh, you'll find that you don't know how you did without it before. It's uh, really quite a nice feature to have, and not terribly expensive in many cases, if you can find the right components at reasonable prices, obviously. Um, one of the most common ways of doing it actually is uh, VFD, Variable Frequency Drive. This is used because alternating current motors vary their speed depending on the frequency of the power supply. And normally with household power supplies you have 50 hertz, 50 cycles per second power supply in the United States or 60 cycles per second in uh, Europe and New Zealand uh, and many other countries. Uh, and but it's a fixed frequency and so the motor goes at a fixed speed and you're stuck with that so then you have to use pulleys to vary it. Well you get around this by converting the power into direct current which is not varying in voltage and then breaking it back down into a sine wave and varying the frequency of that sine wave so that varies the frequency or the speed of the motor. So this is usually done with three-phase motors, though, and most lathes uh, sold with single-phase motors for, for small lathes. Big lathes, however, may have three-phase motors, and quite a lot of machines actually have three-phase. And um, because three-phase is not so common in household power supplies, a lot of people want to change back from three-phase to single-phase. And when they do so, the three-phase motors can be sold off quite cheaply. I've heard maybe something like $50. So you may be able to get a three-phase motor quite cheaply and often at considerably more horsepower than what you would have normally as well. So then you uh, can buy from China uh, or elsewhere actually a variable uh, frequency driver VFD circuit that takes your single-phase power supply converts it into direct current, and then converts it back into three-phase variable speed. Um, and uh, so it's all in one box, and you just plug it all together, and away you go. And you've got variable speed. I used a different approach. I went with a direct current motor. Uh, I came across one at a... Actually, the first one I got was at a street market that I got for $10, and it was a 2.5 horsepower, quite a big uh, direct current motor, uh, working at 180 volts direct current. Uh, and uh, its uh, speed of operation is 4,700 RPM, which is pretty fast, uh, but that's not too much of a problem. In fact, I didn't even have to change the pulleys on mine. I just used the standard uh, boxwood pulleys and just chose the slower speed pulley. And that gave me a speed variation from zero up to... Um, about 1375 RPM, which is about normal maximum speed for the Boxford. Boxford did, however, make a few models that went up to 2000 RPM, uh, and so that should be safe to do as well if you want to. You just have to be very careful not to have too much pressure on your roller bearings at that speed, and not to use too much grease either in the bearings. Packing the bearings with too much grease apparently causes them to overheat and can be quite Bad for the bearings. So how does uh, how do you control the speed of a direct current motor? You could just vary the voltage but uh, if you want to maintain high torque it works out to be better to give the power supply in pulsating direct current so you just give uh, bursts of power. This diagram illustrates the way direct current power is provided to the motor in pulses. So it'll switch to from 0 volts to 180 volts for a certain period of time, then drop back down to 0 volts for, uh, in this case, a longer period of time, and then switch back on for a short time, switch off for a longer time. And the ratio of the time that it's turned on divided by the length of the cycle is called the duty cycle. And the amount of power you get out of the motor is proportional to this duty cycle. Just switching on and off all the time. 
and this turns out to be better than a continuous low voltage power supply, mainly because it provides more continuous torque. The torque does drop off at low speed settings, but it remains much better than it does with a resistor. This is what happens when you turn up to medium power. The pulse width gets wider, and that's of course why it's called a pulse width modulator uh, speed controller. And so we now have uh, medium periods of time when the power is on 180 volts and shorter times when it drops to zero volts. And finally we have the high power diagram which shows very long periods of time when it remains on. In fact it could be even continuously on full power at 180 volts giving the maximum RPM and torque. I've only th shown three speed illustrations here, but of course the actual device has continuously variable duty cycle range from low power to high power in a continuous sequence. In this next video, uh, I'm going to demonstrate the effects of using a resistor to decrease voltage instead of using the pulse width modulator. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, we went to the dump that is the landfill and saw them dropping off a... Um, bench grinder that had been taken off a naval ship that ran on 110 volts direct current. It looked like a good grinder so I took it home but of course it wouldn't run on alternating current. So I made this little box you see here uh, with a bridge rectifier made out of diodes from car alternators to produce direct current. So the voltage was far too high um, but I calculated what size resistor I needed and realized that an ordinary heater would be about the right resistance. So I got this heater that had uh, several different heat settings on it and used that as a series resistor so the power had to go through the heater first and then go to the motor and by the time it got there it would be at reduced voltage. And that worked out so well that my father was still using that grinder 50 years later using that little wooden box. And so <laughs> it still exists. Uh, so when the speed controller hadn't arrived from China yet and I'd already installed the motor I hooked this up again and it worked fine on this DC motor. Um, but uh, we see here an illustration of what happens to the torque which drops off dramatically. Uh, so much so that I could actually stop the chuck with my hand as you see here. So that provides a segue into the topic of torque. And how much torque can we expect to get from this direct current motor? So here's a calculation of torque. At full power, 180 volts, it draws 10 amps. That's 1,800 watts. And the laser will be spinning at a little over 1,200 RPM, which is 20 revolutions per second. So that's the data we need to calculate torque. We take um, the watts of power and just divide by revs per second, and that gives you torque. 1800 divided by 20 is 90, and the units are newton meters. So what is a newton? It's the force that we feel on Earth uh, pulling on a 1 kilogram mass. And since Earth's gravity is described as an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second per second, it's near enough to 10, so I divide 90 by 10, and it gives you 9 kilograms force at 1 meter. Now, you're not usually working at one meter out from the center line of the lathe. Ten, one centimeter uh, from, the, to the, from the center line to the tool would be more typical. And at that distance, one centimeter, you can have a force of almost one ton working on the tool. So you should have plenty of torque with this motor. So now we get to the point you've all been waiting patiently for. What did I use for a controller? Well, this is the device I purchased from China. And you'll need to... Probably a good idea, anyway, to make a note of this uh, number, HQ-SXPWM, which is Pulse Width Modulator, dash X, which may stand for 10, because it's the 10 amp version. There's also an 8 amp version, but uh, you probably want the 10 amps. They also come in a range of different voltages, so you have to make sure you get the one with the right voltage to match your motor, and in my case it was a 180 volt one. We'll assume you're all fluent in Mandarin Chinese because this is the set, only set of instructions that came with the device. Uh, but I was able to install it uh, just based on this. Um, I'll go through the, these uh, connections. This is a row of screw connections where you connect various different wires into the device. L and N stand for line and neutral where you connect the two main uh, connections for your AC power supply. And the next one down is ground, so that gives you a three-pin connection. 
The next two connectors, F plus and F minus, you don't need to use generally if you've got uh, permanent magnets. So this is uh, designed for motors that have coils instead of magnets and have to have field current. So they stand for field and we don't use those. M plus and M minus are the connections for the motor. Now if you connect the motor up with its two wires uh, in one direction, it'll go forwards. And if you flip the two wires over, you'll get reverse direction. So you need to have a switch that will allow you to change polarity. A two-pole double-throw switch does that. Uh, and actually the lathe probably has a master switch which can be used for that purpose. Then there's a ground pin. And the next one is EN, which is Enable. Now I do, this is one that I got wrong when I wired it up. This is just uh, used to turn the motor on and off. It's just a low voltage signal. I just left those permanently connected with a loop of wire. In fact, when I bought it, it had a wire connecting E into ground, and I didn't know what it was. So I just left it there, and that's, that enables the system to run. And if you disconnect it, it stops running. And that's what you're supposed to use for turning the motor on and off. And leave the um, main power supply permanently connected. Now the remaining connections are for the speed controller itself. And actually it came with a pot, a potentiometer, variable resistor, uh, for varying the speed, already wired in, and so it was pretty clear how to do it. And what you do is you connect uh, one end of the potentiometer to ground, G and D, and the other end to plus 5, right at the very bottom of the list, and that creates a voltage gradient across the resistor, uh, varying from 0 at ground up to 5 volts on the other end, low voltage stuff, so it's very safe. And as a slider runs back and forth along that uh, resistor inside the potentiometer, and that would then tap off anywhere from 0 volts to 5 volts, depending on where you put the knob. And that 0 to 5 volt signal is fed into the connector below PWM, the one that says 0 5 volts. So that's the voltage signal going into the device to tell it how fast to run. So that's pretty much the wiring. And the other aspect which I did not know about when I first got it is that it is programmable. So when I put this together, I put it in a clear plastic food container. And the reason for this is that inside the box, hidden away, and I don't know why they do this, underneath the grill where you can't really see it, there is a digital display showing the amps and volts that it's producing. And it's very nice to be able to see that. So I cut a hole in the mesh uh, so that you can actually see this, this uh, LED display. Um, and also, just below that, there are three little buttons which you can press, and I haven't provided access to those because I programmed it earlier. But they are for programming the device, and we'll get back to that later. So I just mounted this in a box, and uh, because I had it in a container, oh, by the way, I did put it in a container because it has a lot of live wires that are connected to it. So it, although it has a nicely insulated uh, box, the wiring for it is all exposed, which seems a bit crazy, so I had to put it inside something. So I put it inside this clear plastic box where I could see the display and mounted those inside the box. And that's all the noise you hear. So when you turn the um, lathe on with the main power switch, it provides power to the circuitry, but it also provides power to the fan. Uh, and as I said, that's not really the proper way to wire it up. The switch should actually turn that enable uh, switch on and leave the power supply connected through a different switch. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, when you use the enable connection, it allows it to go through the appropriate sequence to start up the motor. It'll ramp up to full speed over two or three seconds, and then when you turn it off, it'll ramp down over two or three seconds. And uh, because I'm bypassing that by just providing its uh, main power, that doesn't work quite the way you expect it. And if you have it running and the display is still reading a high voltage, uh, when you first turn the motor off and you turn it off and turn it straight back on again, it tries to draw too much current, throws, it, throws itself off, and then you have to wait 15 seconds for it to reset itself. So that's the downside of the way I connected it. So to recap, that big orange switch I have on the front is providing the power to the circuit box and in actual fact it should be connected to the EN enable connectors instead. Okay, uh, you'll also have noticed that I've put an RPM meter on here and it was a separate purchase 
and so I just put that in another food container box. Originally I had it connected to the same power supply uh, as the rest of the system and the computer fan, but there was some kind of electrical interference that was messing it up, so I replaced that with a battery, a 9 volt, uh, and then later changed the battery to a um, battery charger which is hooked up to the light switch, so when I turn the lights on, my uh, RPM meter comes on. The sensor itself has a Hall effect transistor in it which picks up magnetism and each time the magnet goes past the sensor it picks up a pulse and sends it off to the circuit which displays the revolutions per minute. To set that up I made a copper washer that fits between the two locking rings on the back end of the spindle. They're actually for adjusting the uh, pressure on the uh, tapered roller bearings. And left a tab of copper sticking out and use that to wrap around a small magnet which then passes the sensor each time it goes around. Going back to the uh, Pulsewitz modulator speed regulator, uh, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, it has some good safety features that it'll cut off automatically if the current goes over 10 amps and you have to wait 15 seconds before it'll reset again and it has an over temperature cut out as well and a short circuit cut out uh, and also note that the um, low voltage and high voltage circuits are completely separated, they claim. And finally we come to programming. There are three small switches on the circuit board which you can see if you open up the box and you can use these for programming it or connect to outside buttons if you wish. There are six programmable features you can set and these are chosen by holding the switch number one down for three seconds and once you've chosen one of those uh, features you can increase or decrease the setting with switch two and switch three. Next you add the voltage rating of the motor, in our case it's 180 volts but you can range from 48 to 250 volts with this unit. Then you enter the maximum current that uh, the motor can take ranging from 0.1 to 10 amps maximum, and for this motor it would be 10 amps. Pressing switch 1 again for 3 seconds takes you to the next mode, which is labelled up, so you see up on the display, and this is the up ramp time for 0 to 10 seconds to allow the motor to speed up without drawing too much current. These direct current motors can actually be used as generators as well as motors, and when you suddenly turn the power off and it's still spinning, it acts as a generator, and that can cause problems, so they have a slow ramp down time as well, and that can be adjusted from 0 to 10 seconds, typically about 2 or 3 seconds. That's actually an interesting point because even when the motor is running, it's also acting as a generator, so it's creating a back EMF, it's called, a reverse voltage, which opposes the incoming voltage, so that limits how much current can go through the motor. So once it's spinning, it'll only draw up to about 10 amps, but if you try to uh, apply the same voltage when it's stationary, it'll draw 82 amps, and of course uh, the circuit can't handle that much, and that's why it throws the uh, error signal E1 when you do that. Now this one, when you press it for 3 seconds, you get a display that says IR, and this is for some parameter related to the motor on it. I'm not sure what it is. I think it may be internal resistance, uh, and it can vary from 0 to 100. I just left it as it was, unchanged. Finally, we come to what type of control circuit is used to speed up and slow down the motor with a knob on the front of the machine. And actually, my unit actually came with a potentiometer or variable resistor attached to it and wired up already. So I didn't really have to worry too much about it. But that's what I was describing earlier, where it provides a voltage ranging from 0 to 5 volts to regulate the speed. There's an alternative system which can use 4 to 20 milliamp signal, uh, but we haven't used that. Now that's the end of the programming, but you can also use these buttons to control the machine when you're not in programming mode by rapidly pressing um, switch 1 to start and stop the motor, and switch 2 and 3 to accelerate and decelerate the speed but I've never used those features. Well, that brings us to the end of this uh, video about speed control in motors used in lathes, but of course it could be used in all kinds of different equipment too. And I hope you find it useful and a lot of fun.